facilities in New York and California, providing rescue, refuge, and adoption for as hundreds of farm animals each year. Farm sanctuary shelters enable visitors to connect with farm animals as emotional, intelligent individuals. She believes these animals stand as ambassadors for the resilience on, on factory farms who have no voice, and he has dedicated his career to advocating on their behalf. He holds a bachelor's degree in sociology from California State University, Northridge, and a master's degree in agricultural economics from Cornell University. I don't even need, think he needed that introduction. So <laughs> please welcome Gene Bauer. Great. great. Thank you very much, Helene. And, and congratulations on an amazing event. It's great to see so many people here. So. And thank you all for coming and for your interest in these issues. Uh, most people don't think enough about the way we eat and about the animals who suffer for meat, milk, and eggs in this country. Most people grow up eating animals without thinking about it. I did. I grew up eating meat, milk, and eggs. My parents were doing it, my brothers and sisters, everybody around me. So I just sort of adopted the habit. You know, we are social animals. We tend to do what those around us do. And in our country today, we're sort of mindlessly consuming in a way that is causing enormous suffering of other animals and of ourselves. You know, health problems are enormous in this country. Um, heart disease and cancer are the top two killers. The risks of both can be seriously lessened by shifting to eating a whole foods, plant-based diet. And, you know, we grow up with myths and beliefs. You know, we believe, for example, we need to eat meat for protein. That's an absolute myth. We grow up being told you need to drink cow's milk to get calcium so you don't get osteoporosis. That's also a complete myth. And you know, if you looked at our country, we drink a lot of cow's milk and we also get a lot of osteoporosis. So drinking cow's milk doesn't prevent osteoporosis. And when it comes to protein, um, you know, some of the elite athletes in the world today are vegans. Um, I was in Toronto, Canada last year when a strong man, you know, he competes in these things where they push cars and lift tires and, and he broke a world record carrying the most weight any human had ever carried. And this is a vegan strong man. His name is Patrick Babuyan. He lives in Germany and he carried 1,200 pounds, like over 10 meters, you know, on his back as a vegan. So this, you know, vegan strong man, right? He had thighs that were like that big, you know? And Carl Lewis, the Olympic gold medal athlete, did his best times as a vegan. So, you know, you can get everything you need nutritionally, not only to survive, but to thrive. And um, so vegans, you know, it's, 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 it's very doable. It's getting easier. There's some great restaurants that are represented here and businesses that are providing amazing vegan food that's tasty. You know, being a vegan, you don't have to give anything up. And so for those of you who are vegan, thank you for being here. For those of you who are not vegan, thank you especially for being here and for your curiosity and interest in this way of thinking and living. And so I'm gonna go through a quick bunch of slides here. Uh, so at Farm Sanctuary, the animals are our friends, not our food. The cows get to go out and graze. <laughs> you know, which is very different than how they live on these factory farms. Pigs get to root in the soil, they get to be who they are and enjoy their lives. Um, but that's very different from what happens on factory farms. Um, Farm Sanctuary started uh, in 1986, and at the time I felt it was important to see firsthand what was happening. So I would go to places and I would see animals treated horribly and many animals die. And this is a dead pile behind a stockyard. Um, there, the day I took this picture, there were dead sheep, dead cows, dead pigs. The maggots were so thick you could hear them buzzing. And off of this pile, the sheep here at the far right lifts her head. She's actually alive, thrown alive on a dead pile. So we were stunned that a living animal would be thrown there. Took her off the dead pile, took her to a veterinarian, thinking she would have to be euthanized. But as the veterinarian started examining her, she stood up. And then she recovered fully and lived with us for more than 10 years. So that's Hilda, who's our first rescued animal. Since then, we've gone on to rescue thousands. We currently care for about 1,000 animals between our farm in New York and California. And as I mentioned, once they come to us, they're our friends, not our food. Uh, we treat them very much like people treat their cats and dogs. And these animals flourish. They're individuals. Uh, they come to trust us. At first, you know, they're oftentimes afraid because they've only known cruelty. 
when they have seen people. You know, a person approaches them and cuts off their tail without painkiller. Or uh, for chickens and turkeys, they will cut off, people cut off parts of their beaks. And so it's been painful to interact with people, it has been their experience. But as time goes, they start warming up and they start recognizing they're in a safe place and they learn to trust us and to love and to enjoy life. And it's, and it's a beautiful thing to see that transformation. And in fact, the rescues started partly as a way to heal ourselves. You know, seeing this horror over and over again, seeing animals in, in these confinement systems where they're screaming to get out, and seeing the violence and misery that exists there, and slaughterhouses, is tough. Being able to rescue animals and watch them heal also helped to heal us. You know, kindness to animals is good for animals and it's also good for us. But most animals that are raised for food do not ex experience kindness. This is how veal calves are raised. They're put in these small crates, chained by the neck. And I've got a few more pictures of confinement I'll show and sorry about that, but it's kind of the reality for those of you who are not aware of it. Uh, many of you have probably seen things like this before. Uh, but they're not the only animals that are confined this way. Um, you know, a lot of people have heard about veal. There's been a lot of publicity about, publicity about it. And veal consumption has dropped as a result. People don't think it's okay to treat animals this way. Uh, and that's where I think we have a lot of potential for huge change. Animal agriculture is operating in a way that is outside the bounds of acceptable conduct in our society. Most people don't think this is okay. And when they see it, they think it needs to change. So that's how veal uh, calves are raised. Um, this is a picture I took in Missouri of pigs in gestation crates. These are two foot wide metal enclosures. And this is how they live pretty much their whole lives. They suffer physically and psychologically. They, as I mentioned, they're screaming to get out. They clank against the bars of their cages. You go into these places and, and the air is also thick with toxic fumes because they're they have manure lagoons that, that store the, the manure and that it collects under them in these um, you know, these gullies of, of just, you know, feces. And so it, these places stink and it's bad for the animals and the people that work there too, who sometimes wear face masks because the, the air is so toxic. But these animals live in there 24 hours a day. And then the other confinement system I'll mention are battery cages. This is how egg laying chickens are kept. Uh, these cages are stacked in tiers, lined up in rows in huge warehouses that'll hold about 100,000 birds. And some of these, these farms have a series of these buildings that'll hold up to about three million birds at one facility. Their birds are packed so tightly they can't even stretch their wings. They're constantly scraping against the wire bars of their cages. Their feathers wear off. They have bruises and abrasions on their bodies. And they live this way for about a year before they're sent to slaughter as spent hens. But there's now a lot of slaughterhouses that do not want these chickens because they're so skinny and they're so beat up that they're not very profitable to kill. And time is money. And so sometimes these animals are just literally ground up alive. And I'll tell a, just a story of how bad the laws are. There was a case in California where an egg factory who had 30,000 spent hens and he did, no slaughterhouse wanted them because they were so beat up and skinny and not profitable. So he didn't know what to do with them. So he got a wood chipper. And that's how he disposed of them. A neighbor saw this, contacted us and others, and we tried to prosecute this egg factory for cruelty to animals for throwing live birds into a wood chipper. And they were ultimately found not guilty. And this was because it was considered to be a normal and acceptable and common agricultural practice. And one of the experts who came forward and said that this is a common and an acceptable practice was a veterinarian on the Animal Welfare Committee of the American Veterinary Medical Association. So you have these institutions that are looked at as experts that are validating and supporting enormous cruelty. On today's farms, bad has become normal. And, and that's the situation, and, and people defend it. And when it comes to how we eat also, bad has become normal. And when you get to be a certain age, it's just sort of expected you're going to go on heart medication. You know, I'm in my 50s now, and about five or seven years ago, I felt, you know, I've not been to a doctor for a long time. I should go to a doctor just to make sure everything's okay. So I go to this doctor, and he starts asking me a bunch of questions. He asks if there's any heart disease in the family. 
So I told him that my grandfather had died of a heart attack, that my father had had a heart attack. And before taking any tests or you know, ch checking my blood, he said, well, I might want to put you on heart medication. <laughs> Without any testing, it was unbelievable. So I left that ho hospital, never went back, and went to another one and, and had my blood taken and it was all fine. And since then, also just to prove that vegans get everything we need nutritionally, I've started doing marathons. So I've now done four marathons over the past few years and triathlons, uh, which is where you swim, bike, and run. And I last year did an Ironman triathlon where you swim 2.4 miles, bike 112 miles, and then you run a marathon. So I did that all as a vegan. So <laughs> vegans can do stuff, you know? And it's not, you know, as we grow up, we see a lot of people on heart medication, and then we just assume, well, that's normal. But it doesn't have to be. You know, this is the thing about this lifestyle, is that you, know, you can live and do very well without causing harm. And if we can live and be happy and get everything we need nutritionally without causing unnecessary violence, why wouldn't we? You know, and this is also an industry that does enormous harm to the planet. You know, the United Nations put out a report a couple of years ago called uh, Livestock's Long Shadow. And in it, the UN talked about how animal agriculture is one of the top contributors to the most serious environmental problems facing the planet, including the loss of biodiversity, the loss of scarce resources like water, um, climate change. In fact, animal agriculture contributes more to climate change than the entire transportation industry, according to the United Nations. So this is an industry that is bad for animals, it is bad for us, it is bad for the planet, and in this country, most of us grow up unwittingly supporting it. And it's not something that we need to be part of. We can choose not to. And for those of you who are not vegan, taking small steps is oftentimes a good way to begin a process. And all of us are works in progress. And even the most vegan vegan is not perfect. I've been a vegan for a long time. Um, but, you know, I still, you know, I'll, I'll buy organic produce, which is probably grown with animal manure. So theoretically, is that vegan or not? You know, so you can get into all this minutia and kind of get all distracted. But the key point, I think, is to try to make choices to eat whole plant foods as close to the source as possible to eat a variety of foods. So fruits, vegetables, beans, um, whole grains. And, uh, you know, that is, I think, really the best advice. And if you eat a variety of foods, you're going to get all the protein you need. In our country, we actually get too much protein. So there's oftentimes one of the questions you get is, well, where do you get your protein if you're a vegan, right? Well, beans have a lot of protein. Tofu has a lot of protein. Soy milk has a lot of protein. Tempeh, um, quinoa, uh, and even broccoli has protein. Doesn't have as much, but it has protein. So just eating a variety of whole plant foods is one of the best things you can do. And when I was training for um, the triathlon, I was burning a lot of calories and I wanted nutrient dense foods. So I ate a lot of greens, which are excellent leafy greens, deep leafy greens like kale and so on. Um, so here's a quote that I really like. And it again speaks to how we're a social, social animals. If one person is unkind to an animal, it's considered to be cruelty. But where a lot of people are unkind to animals, especially in the name of commerce, the cruelty is condoned and one's large sums of money or at stake will be defended to the last by otherwise intelligent people. So this, you know, again, just sort of speaks to how bad has become normal. And if everybody is doing something, we assume that it is appropriate and it's the way it's supposed to be. But just because it is a certain way doesn't mean it needs to stay that certain way. Um, a little over 100 years ago, slavery was considered, or actually maybe 150 years ago now, was considered the norm. Before the Civil War, the majority of US citizens considered this institution to be normal and natural. But as time has gone, we've now come to universally condemn human slavery and to say this is not acceptable, this is not appropriate. Um, today, it's considered normal for other animals to be consumed, that they're, they're just products, they're just commodities. And when you treat others in this way, you cause enormous suffering of other animals, but you also, I think, start closing your ability to empathize and understand others. And you then start rationalizing bad things. 
You know, it's been said that we are the rational animal. I think it's more accurate to say we're the rationalizing animal. And we especially rationalize if we don't feel very good about what we're doing. So in the case of exploiting others and causing harm to others and abusing others, there's a tendency not to want to look at those others as living, feeling creatures because doing so makes us feel bad and if we're doing it, we don't want to feel bad. During the Salem witch hunts, the executioners who were charged with killing these witches were told, don't look into their eyes because if you do, they will cast a spell on you and you won't be able to kill them. Well, that spell is your natural human empathy. <laughs> and that's a good thing to get in touch with. So when we are causing harm and abusing others, there's this sort of natural desire not to empathize, not to want to look into the eyes, and not to want to connect with others in this way. And that, I suggest, is not only bad for the, uh, the victims, but also for the abuser. You know, you lose part of your humanity, and, com and empathy is a very important part of our humanity. People who do not have empathy for other people are called sociopaths, and so it's recognized as a pathology. And I would think that this same kind of lack of empathy for other animals is a sort of pathology as well. So, you know, on today's farms, we put these animals behind bars. We confine them, we mutilate them, we abuse them. We, we then start rationalizing our behavior and we start denigrating them. This is the irony of it. You know, the, the powerful group that is abusing another group starts then denigrating the other group to feel good about it. And this is part of this kind of pathology in a sense. And so in the case of turkeys, for example, you know, people say turkeys are dumb, right? You've probably heard this. One of the old tales is that turkeys are so dumb that they'll go out in the rain and they'll drown. Well, you know, we've taken care of turkeys at Farm Sanctuary for more than 25 years. They're free to go in the barn. They're free to go outside. We've never had them go outside and drown in the rain, you know? And being called a pig, right? That's not a compliment. You know, so there's these sorts of ways that language is used to denigrate these victims. But these are creatures that have feelings, they have emotions, they have memories, they develop relationships. They're not that different than cats and dogs. Uh, we have sheep at the farm, for example, who love to be petted. So you'll be there petting them. And when you walk away, they want you to keep petting them. So they'll sometimes paw at you like this to keep petting them. We have pigs who love belly rubs. So you'll come up to like a 500 pound pig and you start rubbing their belly and they'll flop over. And then as you're rubbing their belly, they'll be grunting in pleasure saying, keep going. Uh, and, and turkeys are very friendly too. They'll follow you around the farm. Sometimes they'll sit on your lap. They love human companionship when it is friendly companionship. And they learn that that's the case at Farm Sanctuary. So these animals deserve kindness, and that is also good for us. And the contrast between the factory farm environment and what you feel there and what you experience there is so different than what you feel and experience at Farm Sanctuary. Instead of animals screaming, clanking against the bars, wanting to get out, you have animals enjoying life and thriving and expressing themselves. And I think at the end of the day, that's kind of what we all want. We want to be who we are. We want to express ourselves. And with human beings, we have enormous capacities to express various aspects of ourselves. And at Farm Sanctuary, we encourage people to live according to our better angels, to live according to our empathy, and not according to sort of a denial and a distraction from our connection with others which is too common in our existing food system and farming system and consumer system where we you know, go to the grocery store and buy stuff without really thinking where it came from, but we buy it because we grew up buying it and eating it and everybody around us is doing it. But that's changing. 
you know, events like this and some of the restaurants that are here and some of the businesses are showing that there are other opportunities to live in a way that are ultimately more aligned with our own values. Because, you know, I can't tell people how to live. N none of us can tell somebody else how to live. But what we encourage people to do, ultimately, is to make choices that are aligned with one's own values. And most people are against cruelty. If you talk about factory farming, you talk about how these animals are mistreated, most people think it's bad. It shouldn't happen. It's wrong. They don't feel good about it. And one of the responses to that is people say, don't tell me, I don't want to know, which I don't think is a really good response. It's not a very responsible response. And it's, and it's one that allows denial to continue and dissonance to continue and a person to live in a way that's not aligned. And I think that has some negative ramifications. So we encourage people to live in a way that's aligned with our own values and also to eat and live in a way that is aligned with our own interests. If you look at our country today, we're eating food that makes us sick. That's completely irrational. It's even crazy to eat food that gives us heart disease and cancer and diabetes. That's totally irrational. Um, if instead we ate food that nourished us, and, and, and that would be on our interest. And again, all the evidence I've seen points to whole plant foods as doing that. Plus, buying plant foods is much more efficient in terms of ecological impact. So eating plant foods leaves a lighter footprint on the planet and, and, and it makes food more accessible. I was uh, talking to a group of agribusiness people a number of years ago, making the case that animal farming is inefficient. You know, instead of growing grain and feeding it to animals, it makes more sense to grow the grain and eat it ourselves. We get, you know, costs a lot less to produce food in that way. Also, it takes fewer fossil fuels, less water. And there's a New York Times article talking about how it takes 16 times more fossil fuels for a meat meal versus a vegetarian meal. So there's a lot of evidence for the inefficiency of animal farming. So I was making this case to these agribusiness people. They kept coming back to me and telling me that the most efficient way to feed the world is through industrial animal production. And they kept coming back and saying it takes more land, more water, more fossil fuels, more resources, more energy. And I finally said to them, where do you guys get your information that animal farming is efficient? And they told me the name of the book, and it was called Saving the Planet with Pesticides and Plastics. And that was literally the name of the book. And it speaks to how we are capable of rationalizing all kinds of crazy stuff if we want to do it. So, Human beings <laughs> are, have amazing capacities in so many different ways to do enormous good or to do enormous harm or, come up, or to come up with good reasons to do bad things. And, but each of us has to make our own choices. And it's also, I think, important to real, remember that even the most perfect or the most vegan vegan is not perfect. And as an example of that, I'll just close on a story of um, when Farm Sanctuary first started, how we were been left for dead. We were taking animals out of trash cans or off of piles of dead animals. They'd been, they were very sick and worth, were worth nothing economically by the industry. And so we would take them to the veterinarian and the vet would say, what are you guys wasting your time for? It makes no economic sense. So they had that mindset, these are economic commodities. And we made the point that these animals are not commodities to us. They are living creatures. We want to do what we can to help them. You know, we were treating them like most people treat their cats and dogs as, as part of the family. So it took a while to bring the veterinarians around and they started respecting us for taking care of sheep and goats and pigs and calves and chickens. And, and we were paying our bills, which also didn't hurt. But they came to accept that we saw these animals as living creatures, not just as pieces of meat. And then we had this rat on the farm who we often saw it when we were out there feeding the other animals. And this rat looked pretty bad one day. He was very sick. So I called the veterinarian and said, we have this rat here. And you know, now we're pushing it a little further. <laughs> and the vets hemmed and hawed and took a little while to agree to look at this rat. And they did, and the rat was in really bad shape. So the rat was euthanized. A couple weeks after that, our sheep had parasites. They had worms. So I got a worm and I called the vet and I said, I have this worm here. And there was a big silence. 
on the other side of the phone. And in stilting language, the vet says, uh, uh, well, what, 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 do you, what do you want us to do for that worm? And I explained that the worm was a parasite. We needed medicine for the sheep. And we did, you know, we gave them the medicine. So the, the bottom line is that just living on this planet, we're going to, you know, if, uh, impact others. And sometimes it's going to be in a way that's not necessarily positive for whoever the other creature is. But you do the best you can. So for me, being vegan really is an aspiration to live as well as you can, to live with respect for others, to live with a light footprint on the planet, and also to live well and take care of yourself. You know, that's one thing, too, about in the animal movement. Uh, you know, back in the early days, I remember sort of this mindset that those animals are in cages. They can't move at all right now. How can you take a day off? It is important to take care of ourselves. Compassion should extend to ourselves as well. And um, that's part of the ongoing process that we are learning, that if we want to be in this for the long haul, we need to make it sustainable. And, and part of that is, you know, one of the reasons I'm now, you know, doing these marathons and stuff and really trying to take time to train. And I'm also trying to eat better because as a vegan, you can also eat Oreos and Coke and technically be a vegan. <laughs> I wouldn't advise it. It's, an, it's not the healthiest way to live. So eating whole foods, plant foods, uh, fresh foods, taking care of ourselves, supporting each other in steps. And one of our organizational values at Farm Sanctuary is that we speak to people where they are on their own journey. Um, you know, back in the early days, we might have lifted our arms and said, meat is murder. And we would have been right. But that's not necessarily very effective. And at the end of the day, we want to be effective and we want people to make positive steps. You know, and every small step in the right direction, I think, ultimately will lead to another step. And each time these steps are taken, momentum is built. And we are seeing an enormous shift now in the way we are looking at these issues. We're in the midst of a food movement. Uh, more and more people are interested in eating well. And you know, a lot of it's for health reasons, but a lot of it also is for ethical reasons and for ecological reasons. So there's a lot of reasons now. And the momentum is building, and this event is just part of that. So, I guess I'll, I'll open it up here for questions, but one thing I want to mention real quickly in terms of this mood, food movement, I had a new book coming out in spring. This is actually a galley. There's only a couple of copies. It's, it's, it's not finished yet, but it's going to have like 100 vegan recipes, and it's, uh, so please buy it. It's called Living the Farm Sanctuary Life, uh, The Ultimate Guide to a Mindful, Compassionate, Animal-Friendly Life, and it's, um, being published by Rodell, and it's already available online. And we want to push the pre-sales big time. So keep an eye out for that. And so I'll open it up now to questions. And again, thank you all so much for being here and for your interest in these issues. So thank you. Yeah. Get her! <laughs> one thing I really notice in connecting with horses all my life is that they understand our language much better than we understand theirs. Yeah. So we have no right to say, we take their voice because we say their language doesn't exist, but their language is universal and we can understand these people. Yeah. So we can tell them so much. Yeah. And I think it's a very good point. You know, we're speaking to animals in our language, and they're understanding that better than we are understanding them. And it, it is important for us to listen to them and to understand them. And, and we're enriched by that, ultimately. We can learn. Um, and to the point about riding horses, what I would say there is I look at this in terms of what is our relationship with other animals? Is it one of respect? And, you know, when horses are broken, that's obviously not a nice thing. But in some cases, horses you know, like to go riding, you know? So I, I'm not gonna say black or white is good or bad. It's, 
it's about the relationship. And there's also these things, these like races that dog, not races, but these like obstacle courses dogs do. Sometimes they might like it. I can't really say for sure. I'm, I'm not, but it's the relationship. Is it one of respect and mutual benefit is the question. And we have a long history that we need to make up for where we've brought animals into the world in a certain way and they are here. You know, in the case of animals that live at farm sanctuary, they've been genetically bred to such a point that it's pretty tough to live sometimes. Like turkeys are so big, they have a hard time walking. Um, but we do the best we can for them. So it's not ideal, it's the best we can do. Horses, uh, that, you know, you do the best you can do. So uh, it's not black and white. And so it's about the relationship. Again, is it about mutual respect? And, and, and one thing just to be mindful of too is that human beings are usually the sort of powerful uh, entity in the relationship. We need to be careful not to rationalize it. Well, they like that, because <laughs> they may not. So we really need to listen. And if somebody is getting excited, like a dog gets excited about going for a walk or about doing certain things, um, then you can kind of get a sense that they like to do it. Does a horse get excited about certain things? You know, and, 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 and so these are the questions to think through. And, but then also to think through, they get excited because we're gonna go for a ride. Are they excited to have somebody on their back or are they excited about going to the forest? You know, so that's another question. So just be, so it's, it's, it's it's not black and white. There's all these variations to kind of think through. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and you know, one of my mantras, you can't control others, you can only control yourself. And I think interfacing with different communities, you have an opportunity to move them a little forward. It's a process. We're all in the midst of a process. And you know, we work with farmers. That there's the factory farming, we're intensely opposed. There's animal farmers that are less bad, but killing is still bad. There's one guy I've been talking to lately who's a pig farmer in upstate New York who was feeling conflicted about killing animals. He was taking as good a care of these animals as you could these pigs but he still couldn't handle the killing. And he started writing uh, for Huffington Post and the Dodo, and he talked about, I treat these animals as well as possible, but at the end of the day, I'm still a slaver and a murderer, and I feel bad about it. He recently went vegetarian. He's now transitioning his pig farm into a vegetable farm, and some of those pigs have now been rescued and live at Farm Sanctuary. So there's some process, you know. So engaging people who are not vegan is good because you know we people rub off on those around them and there needs they need to be exposed to a different way of looking you know at the world and yeah how do you guys handle reproduction at how do we handle reproduction and egg production well the animal we do not allow the animals to reproduce um, because there are too many that need homes already in the case of the eggs we collect them and so they cannot be you know uh, sat on and incubated uh, we actually hard boil them, believe it or not, the chicken eggs, and we feed them back to the chickens because most of these chickens came from battery cages where they had their nutrients depleted. In one year, an egg-laying hen uh, in a battery cage will produce about 270 eggs. She will lose about 30% of the weight of her skeleton in calcium to make those eggshells. That's an incredible drain of calcium. So when they eat these eggs, you know, after they've been rescued, that actually helps to replenish some of what they've lost. So that's what we do with the eggs. Yeah. Um, thanks for your talk. Easier. Oh, yeah. Uh, Veg Fester on fire here in North Carolina. It's great to see. <laughs> myself saying uh, to people when I'm talking to them about diet, some, I find myself saying to some people that I'm not vegan, that, uh, you know, my, I've been vegan for 18 years and I guess that's close to 17 years, but I can't handle it. I can't get words to say to what you're saying. And um, people say, well, is it possible to handle products that are not vegan? to hear myself saying, well, yeah, you know, 
Mm-hmm. So I just wonder, and that's yeah. just, okay, last question, last yes. question. Yeah. I, I feel like the Humane Society of the United States would take this approach. I don't know of any other animal groups that really do. Uh, I feel like a lot of the conservative donors that you've talked about, um, they, they um, maybe don't suggest that maybe a more humane way to do it prior to start with the vet system. I don't know if you guys talk about that maybe yeah. step, but if you could share that. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that that is a practical step for a lot of people to eat so-called humane. When that topic comes up, I always say, though, that these labels tend to sound a lot better than they are. You know, so you have a lot of things now labeled as free range that are basically coming from factory farms. So I'm always quick to point out that what it says is oftentimes misleading. And you can't control others. So say if you're going to eat meat, you know, it is better to get it from a farm where the animals are treated less badly. And I usually try to frame it in the negative <laughs> instead of well. Um, and, and, and also, the only way to really know how animals are treated is to actually visit the farms to see what is happening. Because so often, what is being labeled in a certain way doesn't really represent the reality. And free range, you know, only means animals have access to the outdoors. So you'll often have animals raised by the thousands in a warehouse with a small door that goes to a crummy little paddock or even a little porch area. And that's considered access to the outdoors. And that's sold as free range. You have cage-free hens who are de-beaked still. You know, so even the so-called better is bad, and even the best has killing involved, and humane and slaughter don't go very well together. So making that all those points, you can't control others, and if they are going to eat meat, uh, going to a place where the animals have it, have it less bad is, is a step in the right direction. And it's a, So I look at factory farming as the worst, and we intensely oppose it. Most people agree with that. So I really try to talk about that a lot, because that's where there's common ground. And if you can talk about that, that's great. And a lot of these humane labels are still kind of like factory farms. Then you start getting down the scale to animals that are raised in, in conditions that are better, but then they're killed. So we're kind of quiet on that, because those guys can be allies anti the factory farming. Now you get into the plant-based farming, and we're advocates for eating plants. So this is where we start promoting it. But you get into the GMOs and the monocrops. So we're not big proponents of that exactly. But then you start getting to the organic. Although they're really hardline vegan, so it's grown with blood meal. And, and I would agree it is, but it's certainly a better, and we would advocate it. And then you get into the veganic farm, right? The ideal, we're enthusiastic supporters. But there's not a lot of them out there right now. So, so it's a scale of intense opposition to factory farming, intense support for veganic, and between these different poles, levels of support or opposition, or silence even. Because sometimes folks that are doing things you don't totally agree with are allies in some ways. So that's kind of how I look at it. Yeah. Um, I have two quick questions. One is, what do you tell a friend that tells you, and I, I believe you mean your friend, that a god is good and you evil? Yeah, well, you know, religion's a sticky topic. <laughs> You know, if God, God put animals here to be eaten. Well, how do you know that, really? Um, you know, I think asking people questions is a good thing. And if they say, well, the Bible says so. I was at a, at a, at a panel discussion at the National Catholic Bioethics Center, and there was a, a Christian farmer who's a pig farmer saying that God gave us a right to do this. And there was a philosophy guy there, too. There was, it was about seven of us. And uh, the pig farmer made this comment about God gave me the right to raise and kill these pigs. And then this philosophy guy said, well, I'm an atheist. And if you read the Bible, you're not supposed to eat pigs. You know, so, so a lot depends on what religion you're talking about and what they're citing as their source. Um, and you know, my view is that all the religions talk about what you do to the least of these and about mercy and compassion and justice. And, and when you look at that, I think it leads us in the vegan direction. That's my view. Um, I think sometimes the Bible is used to rationalize things, as, as are other religious uh, uh, traditions. And you know, during, again, the abolitionist time, the Bible was cited as a, a source of why things are the way they are. So I think religion can be used to justify things that are not ultimately aligned with. <laughs> Uh, what God would think. Now, there's, oh, God, again, this gets into really sticky stuff to go into. But I think it's about compassion, and, and, uh, and, and that, I think, would be aligned with religion, you know. Just a second comment. Sorry to yeah, take this up your time. Was, uh, I really heard people sound kind of, you know, crazy. 
the I don't know, to a job far more than once for myself. Like, yeah. I don't mean to make it sound crazy, but say we live in, you know, yeah. a regular Brooklyn. Brooklyn. <laughs> Yeah, well, no, we have an adoptive farm animal program. We encourage people to adopt animals if they have the proper facilities. I think demonstrating that these animals are friends, not food, has positive symbolic uh, ramifications. Um, but there are limited homes, you know, so we recognize the limitations to that. Uh, but it, it's modeling a different kind of relationship. Going on, again, this idea that we are social animals, we do those, what those around us do. If people see you have a pet chicken, they start thinking, oh gosh, this animal is something other than a piece of meat or a, a egg producer, producer. So we do that, but we're very careful about where we place animals. And I know our time is up, right? So, but I again want to thank you all so much for being here. Um, check out our website, farmsanctuary.org. Enjoy the festival today. Check out the various things here. Um, I'll be around for the next couple hours, so if you want to talk more or have questions, uh, please let me know. Again, one more plug, buy the book. <laughs> and uh, thank you all so much. And thanks to the organizers of this, the volunteers. And I think we have some interns from Farm Sanctuary, right? Yeah, yeah. Former Farm Sanctuary interns who've done a lot of vo volunteers in this movement are amazing. Thanks, sure. Thanks, everyone. I saw a lot of stuff you had online, and it really changed my mind about things. I had been a vegetarian for 10 years prior, uh -huh. and I thought, as long as I don't eat meat, it's okay for eggs and dairy, but seeing your work really changed showed my the mind about that and showed me the reality of it. So I just want to thank you for that. Oh, well, thanks. Thanks for sharing that. It's great to hear. Yeah. Well, keep on plugging yeah. away, right? now. doing the Adopt the Turkey program for years, too. Oh, excellent. I love that. And that's such a rough holiday for vegetarians, so that's why we did the Adopt yeah. the Turkey, is to provide a different alternative. No, well, thank you very much. I told my daughter I would tell you hello and say thank you. Um, she started sponsoring sprinkles for her high school graduation in May. Oh, yeah. And she wanted me to thank you for doing all that you do. And she's a student at Emory right now. Oh, excellent. Uh, some help down there. Oh, yeah, for yeah, sure. But, yeah. Um, anyway, I promised her I would come today just so that I could tell you on her behalf thank you. And well, tell her thank you, too. Right. You know, we're all in this together. So, thank, thanks very much. I just wanted to um, ask you a question about yeah. uh, and make a comment about when you went to the doctor uh, who said yeah. that you should go on. Uh, right. Uh, have you ever been to a doctor, or did that doctor ever ask you what is your diet? What do you eat? The doctor I go to now uh, is eating less meat now. <laughs> the doctor is learning. That doctor? No, a different doctor. A different doctor. Did that doctor ever talk to you about food? No, not at all. I just I, I never went back. It was ridiculous. They it was ridiculous. Never, never do. No. I've been going through acupuncture for like, for like 10 years, and of course, that's what she talks about is food. Yeah. And, you know, and then I'll, I would say that to the doctors, it's like they're not interested at all about what you eat. It's, it's, it's crazy. I get about 30 minutes of education. They don't learn about nutrition. It's ridiculous. Doctors don't learn about that at all. Which is and nurses don't do a whole and it's like lot. More and more are starting to. There's a movie called Forks Over Knives, and there are doctors involved in that. But still, most doctors are kind of ignorant.